Welcome back to the shop, my friends. Steve here at SKS Props, and in today's build video, I've got one of the largest and craziest builds I've ever put together. It's Guts's Dragon Slayer Sword from Berserk. Now, I absolutely love the Berserk series. It's dark fantasy. All the characters and the weapons are iconic, and they're over the top. Now, this particular sword is a little over six feet, but because it's all made out of foam, it's a little over five pounds, which is fantastic for its scale. You could actually take this around to a convention all day, and it is con safe. Now, with a sword like this, of course, there's a lot that goes into it, and I'm not going to say that this is one of the easiest builds that I've put out there, because it just isn't. The amount of angles that you have to put together on this scale makes it a difficult build, even though the overall weapon design is fairly simplistic. Now, to help you out, I do have this build video, and I have free PDF files available over on my website that you can download in case you would like to make your own. So if you remember back to my templates video, I told you that when I start a new project, I look and see what other makers have done, and a lot of people have made this particular sword. So I scoured the internet to see what everyone else had done to put it together, what kind of pitfalls they had, what worked, what didn't, and then came up with my own version of it, and that's very important. There's no point in starting from scratch if you can learn from other people's mistakes. If you want to build this sword or any of my projects and support this channel at the same time, be sure to buy some of my HD foam from Blick Art Materials. If you go through the links that are in the description section and those that are on my website, it helps support me, which means I get to continue to make awesome things like this, give you free PDF files, we know that's the big one, and show you how to put it all together. So, I want to show you what it takes to put Guts's Dragon Slayer Sword together and give it this insane blood texture. Let's go ahead and get started. I start off by printing out the template that I created in Photoshop so I could make sure that I got the size and the scale correct. For this build, you're going to need two sheets of 10mm foam and a little bit of 6. Part A is going to make up the main body of the sword. I can remove the main body of the template from the edges since I'm going to work on this first. Using some 1, 2, 3 blocks as paperweights, I trace around the template with a pencil. And just to make sure that I got my lines correct, I also use a straight edge. I cut a rough shape of the main body using a well sharpened blade. I'm then going to take this piece and trace around it and cut out the other half. These two sections are going to be tacked together with some Bob Smith super glue. That way, when I cut it out, both pieces are going to be identical. The main support structure for this blade is going to be a 1 inch PVC pipe. Now, there are different internal wall thicknesses, so I made sure to get the Schedule 40 450 PSI. The pipe is cut to approximately 70 inches. This should be enough to run up the length of the blade while still having plenty for the handle. Because the pipe is going to be glued into place, I'll rough up the surface with a sanding sponge. I can now take my knife and cut apart the two halves. I'll then mark the middle of the blade showing exactly where the PVC pipe needs to be attached. Weldwood contact cement is going to be used to adhere the PVC pipe into place. And at this point I'm very careful to make sure that the handle lines up just right. Part B is a height template. This is going to be used to cut strips that will run along the PVC pipe and along the perimeter. These strips are going to be cut out of 10mm foam and will be approximately 55 inches long. Here you can see how they're going to make up a box for the interior of the blade. First off, I'm going to adhere strips to either side of the PVC pipe using some contact cement and a little bit of super glue. I start at the end of the PVC pipe at the top of the blade and then slowly work my way down. At this point, I'm just adhering the bottom. After they're in place, I can then go back and add adhesive to the interior.
then using a long straight edge that could add equal pressure to the entire strip. I'd like a flat edge to the exposed PVC pipe, that way it'd be easier to adhere to the other half. So I glued a thin strip of 2mm foam to the pipe using some super glue. For the very tip of the blade, I marked the strips where they'd need to be cut so they'd line up for the perfect angle. These pieces were then glued together and I could check for fit. Once I determined it was all good, I could then mark the sides that needed to be cut. This is where the other long strips are going to butt up to along the perimeter. This section can then be glued into place along with the other 10mm strips. I also cut an additional support strip for the top of the PVC pipe. This was all just done by eyeballing the angles that needed to be cut. And then after I made sure that it would fit, I could glue it into place. For the rafting on the interior of the blade, additional pieces are cut from the 10mm strips. These are marked and cut at different sizes, since the blade is wider at the base than it is at the top. I didn't really measure out the spacing of these, I just kind of put one about every 4 inches. With the interior structure of the blade done, I can now glue the other half to the top. I had to make sure that this piece lined up pretty good, otherwise if I was off, the whole blade could look misshapen. So starting at the top, I slowly worked my way down the blade to the very end. To keep the weight down, I wanted the edges of the blade to be hollow. This would require cutting strips of 10mm foam with a 60 degree angle on top and a 20 degree angle on the bottom. With these cuts, it would create the perfect triangle for the blade's edge. Now there are two ways to accomplish these cuts. Number one, if you have a bandsaw, you could tilt the table easily for the 20 degree. But then you're gonna have to make a jig of some kind to get the angle up to 60 degrees on the other end, which is what I did here. The other way, if you notice my template, I have faint lines at the top and the bottom of these pieces. Start by doing a general cut angle to remove most of the foam. Then you can easily go back and refine this shape down to that line with your rotary tool. It's going to take some time, but it's a lot easier and cleaner than if you had to sand the whole edge down from multiple strips of foam. With my strips cut, I can now heat seal where the adhesive is going to go. This is going to create a stronger bond. Once again, I'm using Weldwood contact cement along the 60 degree angle at the top. After the contact cement is dried, I'll also add a little bit of super glue. This double adhesive method is my way to make sure that this seam won't ever split. The top edge of the foam can then be pressed together, making a triangle. This process can then be repeated for the blade edge on the opposite side.
Notice that I have a 1-2-3 block in between the two pieces so they don't stick together by accident. And you can see here how the edges of the blade will attach to the main body. Before I can attach these, I want to reinforce the interior by using part D to cut out a bunch of triangles. I then marked placement of the triangles at approximately every 3 inches. These triangles can then be glued into place using some super glue. To make sure that I could line the edges of the blade up with the body precisely, I cut out a small section of each triangle. This will allow for a little bit of flex while being glued into place. I don't know that it really mattered, but I'm building this as I go, so it's always a learning process. Before I attach the sides, I want to make sure that the point of the blade is glued on first. Using part E, I cut some additional strips of 10mm foam. Just like the edges, these pieces are glued together to create a triangle but it's a little bit smaller than the sides. From here I could take my template and draw out the angles that needed to be cut. And just like the edges, I glued some structural triangles inside, but these do need to be a little bit smaller. I could then cut the foam and see how the pieces lined up together. I heat seal these cuts and then using more contact cement, I could then glue these two halves together. Now when doing this, take your time and make sure that all of these pieces line up just right. With the top section assembled, I can now attach it to the main body of the blade. Here I'm using super glue because I want it to set quick and I'm only working one side at a time. And the great thing about foam is that you can kind of push and pull it to get it to fit exactly how you need. I sand away any additional super glue that might have leaked out. And here you can see the tip of the sword is looking great. Now I can take the long strips and cut the angle that I need that will match up to the part E pieces. And this is why I recommend to have pieces longer than necessary. So if you mess up one of the angles, you have more material to play around with. Then you'll have a bunch of excess material at the very bottom of the blade where you can cut that flush. Contact cement is once again going to be used to adhere the edges to the main body. And to make sure that it doesn't stick before I want it to, I lay a piece of craft paper along the bottom. This is going to help me allow to focus on just the top edge for now. And starting at the tip, I then slowly work my way down the blade, matching the very top of the edge up to the body. And here you can see the excess foam that I have at the bottom that I'm going to trim away later on. But with a complex shape like that, it's always good to have too much than not enough. I could then remove the craft paper, apply some super glue, and then work my way down this part of the edge as well. And to make sure that the foam is firmly pressed together, I use the side of a permanent marker. Now when gluing all these sections together, the angles are tricky. So if they don't perfectly align, especially at the top, don't worry about it. You can always sand it flush with a rotary tool later on after it's been attached. In worst case scenario, you could always add some battle damage and blood to cover it up. Here I am still working down the opposite side, and always safety first. Whenever I heat the foam or use contact cement, I'm always wearing my respirator.
And here's an up close detail shot of me pressing the two pieces together. With the angles cut, they line up just right. Now it's time to soften and clean up all the seams using my rotary tool and a sanding sponge. Before I cut away the excess material at the bottom, I first need to cap it, that way when it is cut it looks like a solid piece. To do this I'm just going to glue another triangle into place. Then I can mark with a pencil straight across the foam exactly where it needs to be cut. And here you can see after it's been cut, there's a little sliver of that triangle left. But the bottom of the edge looks pretty solid. Now it's time to work on the detail guard at the base of the blade. This will be made up of parts F, G, and H. Part F will be made out of two pieces of 10 millimeter foam. Just like the main section of the blade, I'm going to glue these together and then cut them out so they're identical on either side. Parts G and H will be cut out of 6mm foam. And because they all have the same shape, I decided to glue them together, make a foam sandwich and cut them all out at the same time. I could then cut all the individual sections apart and have my pieces ready to go. The bottom of part F is cut at a 45 degree angle. This will allow it to match up to part I later on. The bottoms of part G and H will also be cut at a 45 degree angle. Parts G and H are cut out of the same piece of foam. I could then do a rough cut and clean up the interior and exterior edges using my rotary tool. Part G can then be super glued to part F, lining up these pieces all the way around the exterior. After marking placement, part H can then be glued to the middle. And here you can see how the 45 degree cut lines up at the bottom of the piece. I can then mark placement with a pencil and glue it to the base of the sword. Part I is going to continue the guard detail at the bottom and it will be cut out of 10mm foam. The two longest edges will be cut at 45 degree angles. Parts J and Part K will be cut out of 6mm foam and refer to the template to see the 45 degree cuts on them as well. To remove the holes in the middle of the foam pieces I'm going to start by using a Forstner bit but you could also just rough cut this with a hobby knife. After the hole had been made, I could then get it to the exact size and clean it up with my rotary tool. Part I was checked for fit, and once I determined it was okay, I could then glue it to the bottom of the guard, matching up all of the angles. The same process was then applied to parts J and K. This guard has a slight angle at the bottom. I marked this with a pencil and then removed the foam using my rotary tool. There was a very slight imperfection, so I decided to use some gap filler. 
I've never used this compound before, but it seemed to work okay. Normally I'll just use Quick Seal. With this compound, you put it on, smooth it out with water, and allow it to dry. You could then go in and sand it smooth with a sanding sponge. The same process is very similar to how foam clay works on seams. For the handle, I wanted to make sure there was at least 12 inches from the base of the guard to the pommel. The pommel itself will be made out of part L. This is going to require 7 pieces of 10mm foam to be glued together. So I was able to cut 7 squares of the approximate shape to match the template. And then I used super glue to glue them all together. The reason I didn't use contact cement is because with exposed seams, heat can make these seams open up. After all the blocks had been allowed to cure, part L was traced on top and then cut out. I then drew the template onto the side and then reattached the two pieces that I had cut off with some tape. This is going to allow the bottom of the piece to remain flat and it's going to be easier to cut a straight line through. I could then cut away the tape and reveal the shape of the pommel. I need to remove foam from the middle to make room for the handle, so once again I'm going to turn to my Forstner bit. This will help me get a bulk of the material out of the way, and then I can clean it up and expand this hole using my rotary tool. The sides also have a slight bevel to them, so I mark that with a pencil and also remove that with the rotary tool. With all the refining and sanding complete, I can then heat seal the piece with my heat gun. Next up, I'm going to work on the chain detail, which is going to be made out of part M. This is going to be traced and cut out of some 6mm foam. The top edge is rounded over with a rotary tool and then heat sealed before being glued into place. Part N will make up the chain and this is going to be traced and cut out of some 6mm foam. To simulate the weld on one side, more super glue is added than necessary and then I hit that with some accelerator. To attach the chain, I decided to use some 10mm foam dowel. I cut this piece in half and then glued it around the top section of the chain. Then using some scissors, I cut the back side flush and then glued it into place. With most of the fabrication done, I decided now was a good time to heat seal the entire piece. Looking at some of Kentaro's cover paintings, sometimes Dragon Slayer has a really cool texture to it that I wanted to simulate. So I was able to take the side of a wire brush and drag it down the side of the edge. I'm not pushing real hard with this, just enough to slightly emboss the surface. But I like it, it makes it look as though a hunk of iron has been deliberately sharpened to a point. The reason I didn't finish the handle earlier is because I want to try to counterbalance the weight of the sword. And the best way I could figure to do that was to get a 10 inch 5 8 carriage bolt from the hardware store. This bolt is going to be wrapped with a little bit of 6mm foam just to make it snug and it's going to be inserted inside of the PVC pipe. It's not a lot of weight, but it does actually help to counterbalance the blade. With the bolt hammered into place, the pommel can now be super glued to the end. I decided I wanted a forged texture for the center of the blade, and to do that I'm going to have a mixture of Valspar stone and Flex Seal. Now normally I would probably tell you to do this outside, but it is currently freezing so that's not going to work. So I try to cover my workspace as best I can with some craft paper. The edges of the blade can then be protected using some masking tape and paper towels. 
I was then able to apply a decent amount of the stone texture paint. While the stone texture was still wet, I then applied some flex seal on top. Then using a sponge, I could go in and give the surface an even greater variation. And for certain areas, I went back and applied even more of the stone. This side of the sword was then left to dry for several hours. Later on, the sword was flipped over and the texture process was then repeated. The next day in the shop I came back and everything had fully cured. Going back to those painted covers I wanted to add a little bit of battle damage. And I did that by using my wireless Dremel and a stone bit. I just couldn't leave the blade pristine, Guts has seen way too much action on the battlefield. Now it's time to prime and paint, and to prime the surface I'm going to be using a couple coats of Plasti Dip. This took about a whole can and it was nice enough one day to prime it outside. For my base primer color I'm going to be using some ultra flat green camouflage. This was dusted on top of the cured Plasti Dip. And I live in the Midwest, so of course the next day it was absolutely freezing and there was 4 inches of snow on the ground. Flat antique nickel was then dusted onto the sword and left to dry. With my base colors added, I can now start to smooth the edges using some graphite powder. The graphite powder was applied with a shop cloth to the edges and the guard. I didn't have to worry about the center of the blade because that's going to be painted black later on. Now graphite powder is very messy, so make sure you have some craft paper down, and after it's applied, you buff the surface. To further accent the striations on the blade, I'm going to be using some iridescent rich silver from Liquitex. This is applied in the same direction as the texture I had made using the wire brush. And notice I vary the amount of paint applied. It's not the same consistency all the way across. This is going to make it more visually interesting. To give a different cast look to the guard, the paint is first stippled on and then dry brushed across the surface. This same stippling technique is also applied to the pommel. With the paint applied, I did one more extremely light dusting of the flat antique nickel. For the middle of this sword, I first sectioned off the area using some masking tape. Liquitex Mars Black is going to be applied directly to the surface using a filbert brush. I don't add a lot of water to this application because I don't want the paint running under the tape. With the edges taken care of, I can now fill in the middle with a larger brush. I'll first paint the pigment onto the surface, and then I'll go back and stipple it to alleviate any brush strokes. Of 
I wanted a stronger highlight on the edge of the blade, so I'm going to use some Liquitex Bright Silver. This is dry brushed from the edge inward, keeping that horizontal brush stroke. To wrap the handle, I decided to use a pretty thick strip of cotton. I have seen others use athletic tape, but I really wanted a bulky look to it. The cloth was wrapped around the handle, and when I got to the bottom, I separated the strip. This could then be glued and tied off. To give the cloth some wear and tear, I started off with a hobby knife and then switched over to a wire brush. This did a pretty decent job fraying the edge. To give the cloth some aged appearance, I used some dirty down dark brown spray. This spray is fantastic at weathering props. Then I used a little bit of water to move the pigments around to simulate the oils left by your hand. Now you of course could leave your blade here, but I wanted some blood. So I'm going to be applying some perma blood to the blade. I'll start off with a mop brush for the general shape and then switch over to using my hands for a thicker texture. Really plan out this process. Try to envision what it would be like if this sword swung through a monster. So while I'm adding brush strokes, I'll also go in with a toothbrush to add splatter while the layers are drying. This is a thicker paint, so this back and forth builds up on the blade. I also ended up making my own brush using some plant stalks. After the droplets were made with the toothbrush, I could then take this custom brush and give them some direction. This direction would simulate the velocity of the blood hitting the blade while it's swinging. I obviously watched too much Dexter back in the day. So with a couple of layers of perma blood down, it's now time to darken parts of it up to make it look coagulated. So I'm going to mix some perma blood with some Liquitex Mars Black. This is going to be used as a paint-on mixture and as a build-up with some 5-minute epoxy. I'm going to do the epoxy first, and parts A and B are equally measured on a piece of poster board. After being thoroughly mixed together, some of this paint mixture is added to the epoxy. This mixture will then be applied with a chip brush directly to the blade. Now with this process, a little bit goes a long way. I tried to think about where would gore build up on the blade. So primarily I would apply it to the edge and then streak it up towards the middle. And of course it would also catch on the textures in the middle of the blade. After this had dried, I then flipped the blade over and repeat the process. After the 5 minute epoxy had cured, I could then go back with my paint mixture and a large mop brush with some water. 
I would then splatter the surface here and there, again using my custom brush to simulate velocity. I could then also go back with my toothbrush and add additional finer splatter. It's all showcasing a buildup of all these elements on the blade. If it's just the permablood, it's not near as visually interesting as all of these put together. After trying to remind myself multiple times, I still almost forgot. I need to add two circles to the bottom of the guard detail. To do this, I'm going to be using a half inch hole punch, just pressing it into the foam and twisting it. This is going to slightly cut into the surface and give it a depression. But for this small detail, it's more than enough. So you all can see the steps that I took to make a giant iconic weapon from Berserk. And hopefully you learn some new tips and tricks along the way. Not just putting the sword together, but painting it, the logistics of making a large weapon, the blood effects. These are all things that you can file away for future builds. And if you are building any of my builds or utilizing HD foam, be sure to tag me at SKS Props on Twitter and Instagram because I want to see your creations. Until next time, build your best with the best. HD foam.